The Bible teaches that the great God who authored this universe in which we live is also a God of history, a God who has and does intervene in the affairs of men. In Exodus 3.14, he is the great eternal I Am. In Revelation 1.4, he is the God who was and is and is to come. The Bible doctrine of the intervention and the working of God in his world has been called by Bible students for many years the providence of God. The word providence derives from a Latin word, providentia, which literally means foresight. And it has to do with God's supervision, His sustaining, His management, His intervention in the affairs of this world for the accomplishment of His ultimate purpose. Now, I think in order for us to really appreciate what providence is, perhaps we would enhance our understanding if we looked at it negatively for a few moments and discussed what it is not. Providence stands in opposition to what we might call fatalism. The idea that the universe is self-existent and self-sustaining and merely operates according to a set of mechanistic principles or laws so that uh, whatever will be, will be. Now, the Bible does not teach that and rationality doesn't teach it either. Common sense, as well as a great body of evidence, would indicate that the universe is not eternal, and it's not self-sustaining. Furthermore, the providential working of God stands in opposition to the philosophy of deism. Deism says that there is a God somewhere in some remote corner of the universe, but that God, having created the universe, sort of stepped aside and adopted a hands-off policy so that now the universe is a self-operating machine of some sort. Well, that doctrine is anti-biblical, for it denies such things as the atonement, the incarnation, the miracles of the Bible, God's love, His benevolence, the inspiration of the Scriptures. And further, it makes no sense to affirm that God would create the universe and then just step back and leave it all alone. Moreover, providence stands in opposition to what we might call Pentecostalism in this regard, and we'll develop this uh, more in detail later. Pentecostalism sees almost every act of God in the world as some sort of a supernatural, miraculous phenomenon. Salvation is miraculous. If someone gets sick and then they are subsequently recovered, a miracle has been performed. Well, it's not our purpose tonight to discuss the fact that miracles are not being performed by God. But we shall simply suggest that miracles have served a twofold purpose in the scheme of God. First, they have been involved in the creation process. That's not going on today, according to Genesis 2, 1. And secondly, miracles have functioned to corroborate the revelatory process of God in His communication of His mind to the mind of man. 
The Bible teaches that the purpose of miracles is not needed today since the biblical account records the miracles of Christ, and these serve to validate our faith in the deity of the Lord Jesus according to the testimony of John in John 20, 30, and 31. Furthermore, the Bible teaches that the methods by which spiritual gifts were imparted in the first century, namely Holy Spirit baptism and the imposition of apostolic hands, neither of these is available today, and consequently the methods by which miraculous gifts were imposed are no longer with us. Thirdly, the Bible teaches in very clear language in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 and following, and in a parallel section in Ephesians chapter 4, that spiritual gifts were designed to be temporary in their function and hence were to pass out of the church's possession with the completion of the revelatory process. And so we need to understand that when we talk about the providence of God, we're not talking about the miraculous, we're not talking about that which is supernatural uh, in the miraculous sense. I think one of the best ways that we can approach our subject tonight is to lay down some principles by which our view of divine providence must be approached. The first principle that I want to mention is this. When one considers the providential operation of God, he must view this theme in a light that is consistent with both the nature of God and the will of God. By that I mean to say God would never operate in any way that was inconsistent with his nature, nor would he ever providentially operate in any way that was a contradiction to what he has expressed in his will. For example, one should never say that God has providentially worked in his life to cause him to do that which is wrong, because God is a holy God, and he cannot do that which is wrong. He cannot tempt man with that which is wrong, James chapter 1. And so it would not be fitting to suggest if one were involved in an immoral situation that the providence of God had worked to bring that about. For example, if some member of the church were traveling through Nevada and they were tempted on an impulse to put a dollar in a slot machine and all of a sudden it hit big and they won a quarter of a million dollars, they shouldn't say, my, how wonderful the providence of God worked in this regard. <laughs> providence of God didn't have anything to do with that immoral situation. The Bible has very plainly revealed the plan of salvation. One should not conclude, therefore, that the providence of God worked in any way to save him in some manner different from the plain specified terms of salvation in the New Testament. So the principle is the providential working of God must be interpreted consistently with both God's nature and his revealed will. In the second place, we must observe that God in his providential operations will never, though he works in the lives of men, he will never overpower a man's ability to choose between right and wrong. The preservation of our volition must ever be maintained. Now let me give you some Bible examples of this. This is tremendously important. In the Old Testament, in the 10th chapter of the book of Isaiah, beginning in verse 5, we read of God's providential use of the great Assyrian nation to bring that nation against the northern kingdom of Israel for the purpose of punishing his people who had immersed themselves in idolatry and wickedness. 
Now, God says of the Assyrian power that this nation is going to be the rod of my anger and the staff of mine indignation. I'm going to use this nation to punish my people. And yet in Isaiah chapter 10, about verse 7, the prophet is very careful to specify that God does this. He uses this nation because it was already in the heart of the Assyrian to destroy. Because the Assyrian was of that nature, because he was bent in that direction, God said, well, I'll just use you then to accomplish my purpose. And he did. In Habakkuk chapter 1, beginning about verse 5 and following, we have a similar situation in which God describes to Habakkuk the prophet how he's going to use the Babylonians to, publish, uh, to punish the southern kingdom of Judah. And God says in connection with that event that the Chaldeans are a bitter and hasty nation marching through the land to possess nations that are not theirs. So that's the way they were termed. That was their disposition. A ruthless, bitter, conquering power. Nonetheless, God says in this connection, I am working a work which you will not believe even though it be told you. In Jeremiah chapter 25, referring to this very same situation, he says of the Babylonian monarch Nebuchadnezzar that he is my servant. Let me make this point, folks. God can use everybody in the world to bring about his ultimate purpose. If you submit yourself to the will of God and you allow him to use you to his glory, he will bless you for it. If you rebel against him, he can use you anyway to bring about his ultimate purpose. And then he will punish you for your rebellion against him. Now, don't misunderstand me. God never does wrong to bring about his ultimate purpose but he can use evil men as tools to bring about his righteous purpose in the earth. This was exactly the case with reference to Pharaoh. Pharaoh was an atheistic, infidelic devil who did not know nor respect God. When Moses came into his presence in Exodus chapter 5 and verse 1 and said, Thus saith the Lord God, let my people go. Pharaoh said, Who is Jehovah? That I should hearken unto his voice. I know not him. In Exodus 9, 16, God said, For this cause have I made Pharaoh to stand before me, that I might show my power through him, that all the nations may know that I am God. God used that wicked man providentially to bring glory to himself. And so, though God uses people, he uses them consistent with their own willpower. He never makes anybody do right. He never forces anybody to do wrong, but he can use them in either capacity. In the third place, we must distinguish between God's providential working and God's miraculous working. And here's a simple way to draw the line between the two. In providence, God uses natural law to bring about his will. In the miraculous, God suspends natural law and he operates directly. Let me give you some examples. God sent his son into the world through the body of the Virgin Mary. The New Testament record informs us that Mary conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
she had not known Joseph, her husband. Well, that was a miracle. God performed a miracle to bring his son into the world. Back in the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel, we read about a godly woman whose name was Hannah. She was childless. The Bible said Jehovah had shut up her womb. She prayed to God for a son. She said, Lord, I'll dedicate him to you all of his years. The Bible says that God answered her prayer. Now listen. And her husband, Elkanah, went in unto her. He knew her. That's a biblical expression for they engaged in sexual activity between that husband and wife. He knew her. She conceived and brought forth the son, Samuel. God was involved in that. But he was involved in it through the natural law of procreation. Let me give you another example. When the Assyrians invaded the northern kingdom of Israel, they marched on further into the southern kingdom. As a matter of fact, the Assyrians conquered 46 fortified cities in the southern kingdom of Judah. They came right to the back door of Jerusalem. And Sennacherib, the Assyrian monarch, had in his mind to conquer the city of Jerusalem. He says, as a matter of fact, in one of his documents that has been excavated by the archaeologists in recent years, that he shut up King Hezekiah like a bird in a cage. Well, Hezekiah was scared to death. He went to Isaiah and asked Isaiah to plead to God on behalf of the southern kingdom. God for informed Isaiah the prophet, I'll take care of this situation. You can read about this in the 37th chapter of the book of Isaiah. In one night, the Bible says, the angel of Jehovah went through the Assyrian camp. And the next morning, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers woke up dead. That was a miracle. In one night, 185,000. Well, what happened to the king, Sennacherib? He was not on the scene. He was away in a distant city. Now, the Bible says this. Isaiah chapter 37, verse 7, I believe it is. God said, I will put a spirit in him and he shall hear tidings and he shall return to his own land and there be slain by the sword. What does that mean? I'll put a spirit in him and he shall hear news and go home. And be killed in his own land. In the last three or four verses of chapter 37 here in Isaiah, the Bible says that Sennacherib did go home. And while he was worshiping his pagan gods in one of his temples, his two sons came in and killed him with the sword. The Bible doesn't indicate that there was anything miraculous about it. But who would deny that God did it? God killed that pagan king, but he employed his own wicked sons to accomplish the task. You see the difference between the miracle on the one hand and the providential working of God on the other. In Matthew chapter 8, we read of the Lord and his disciples on the Sea of Galilee when a fierce storm came up and the disciples were frightened and, you know, Jesus said, peace be still. And instantaneously, the elements of the weather were calmed. A miracle had been performed by the Lord. In contrast to that, let your minds go back to the days of Elijah the prophet. When the people of Israel were involved in worshiping Baal and 
the other pagan gods of that day. And by the way, Baal was the storm god. He was the god among the Canaanites who allegedly controlled the weather. So God said, ladies and gentlemen, let me teach you who controls the weather. And he sent a great drought that came over the land of Palestine for three and a half years. And finally, Elijah the prophet was employed by God in praying for a cessation of that drought. The Bible says that Isaiah prayed and he sent his servant to look out over the Mediterranean Sea. And the record says that first he saw a cloud the size of a man's hand. And then it moved on eastward. And the record says that the skies were blackened and the winds blew and it rained. Now James tells us in James chapter 5 that this came about in response to the prayer of Elijah. God was doing it. God was controlling the elements of the weather. But whenever it rains in Palestine, it always comes from clouds that come off of the Mediterranean Sea. God used natural law. But here's the point, brethren. God can manipulate His own natural laws without a miracle being involved. He has the reins in His hand. He has the control in His hand. And He can use His own law to bring about His purpose in the lives of people. Now there's one other point I want to make in this connection. And that is this. In the miraculous, God operates in a public, dramatic, demonstrative way. A miracle is God's exclamation point to the fact that I am doing this. It's a documentation of the work of God in a given circumstance. And a miracle is so powerful and so dramatic that it simply cannot be ignored. In Acts chapter 4, after Peter and John had healed the lame man at the beautiful gate of the temple, even the Jewish rulers in the city of Jerusalem said this, that a notable miracle hath been performed is manifest, and we cannot deny it. On the other hand, when God works providentially, He works behind the scenes. One does not know that God is providentially working unless, for example, in Bible times, there was some revelation of the fact that this was a providential working of God. No one today can subjectively say, with reference to any event that has happened in his life, I know this was an act of God's providence. We may say that we know God providentially works in our lives, but to document any specific instance, we cannot do it because providence is a working behind the scenes. Let me give you several Bible examples. In the latter part of Isaiah chapter 44 and in the first part of Isaiah chapter 45, God talks about the fact that he's going to use Cyrus the Persian king, to deliver his people from Babylonian captivity and allow them to go back to the homeland once again. Isaiah, writing 150 years before Cyrus is even born, describes this monarch as God's shepherd, God's anointed. And yet in the first part of Isaiah 45, though God is using this man, the Lord says regarding him, He hath not known me. Cyrus had no idea under the shining sun that God was using him in that capacity, but Isaiah tells us that he was. When Joseph's brethren sold that young man at the age of 17 down into Egyptian slavery, it was many years later, according to the record in Genesis 45, that Joseph told his brethren not to be grieved with themselves. For he said, It was not you that sent me hither, but God. Now, brethren, we know that those brethren of Joseph's sold him down into Egyptian slavery. 
They did it. And Stephen says in his great sermon in Acts chapter 7 that they did it because they were moved with envy against him. They did not recognize the fact that they were being used as instruments of God. But Joseph said, in retrospect, as he looked upon the situation, perhaps with insight from God into the meaning of this, that it was really not you that sent me hither, but God did it. God working behind the scenes. Surely none of us who is familiar with the great message of the book of Esther would deny that God providentially used Esther to save the Jewish people from the wicked plot of Haman. And yet her uncle Mordecai said to her in this connection, Who knoweth? but whether thou art not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Who knows? He said, perhaps we're being used by God, but we don't know. But we know, looking back on it, there's a real interesting case in the New Testament, in the book of Philemon. Philemon was a wealthy Christian who lived in the city of Colossae, and he had a slave by the name of Onesimus. And Onesimus had run off from Philemon and he had gone to Rome. And while in Rome, he had come in contact with the Apostle Paul who converted him. And Paul sent him back home bearing this letter to Philemon with him. And in that little one chapter epistle, he says this. Paul says concerning Onesimus, perhaps... He was separated from thee for a season that thou mightst have him forever. Paul was an inspired man. And he saw the possibility of providence in this. But even he said, perhaps he was separated from thee that he might be with thee forever. So you see the difference between God's dramatic working in the performance of a miracle, and God's behind the scenes working in providence. Now, let us look at several different areas of the providential operation of God in His world. In the first place, the Bible teaches that God operates throughout the entire universe to sustain it. In Hebrews chapter 1, concerning our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says in the first few verses, that He is upholding all things by the word of His power. That passage lets me know that the universe is not some mechanistic, self-operating machine. Sure, it operates according to laws that are dependable and repeatable, but those laws are maintained and sustained and upheld by Christ. In Colossians chapter 1, the great Apostle Paul, in discussing the supremacy of Christ, says that through Him or by Him all things consist. That means they're held together by the power of Christ. So, God is operating throughout the entire universe. In the second place, the Bible teaches that God operates in nature. A wonderful exercise in spirituality in this connection would be to read Psalm 147. It's a grand affirmation of God's working through the natural laws of weather and so forth. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, God sends His rains upon the just and the unjust. And we've already demonstrated by the case of Elijah that God can intervene and manipulate his natural laws to bring about his purpose. So God operates in the natural world in that regard. The Bible also teaches that God providentially operates in connection with his lower creatures, the animal realm. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, Consider the birds of the heaven. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into the barns, yet your heavenly Father careth for them. 
On one occasion, the Lord said, not even a sparrow falls to the ground without the Father's concession. Whenever I read Matthew chapter 6, and I read of the Lord's affirmation of God's providential concern, even for his little creatures like the birds, I'm impressed with that poem that I once read. It goes something like this. Said the robin to the sparrow, I would really like to know why these anxious human beings rush around and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. The whole lesson of that in Matthew chapter 6 in God caring for his little creatures is that he will care for us even infinitely more than these lower forms of life. A good example of God's providential use in the animal world is found in Genesis 22. When Abraham had exercised great faith and was about to kill his own son and God stayed his hand and then he looked aside and saw a ram hung by his thorns in a thicket. Nothing miraculous about that. But would you deny that God caused the ram to be there? Now don't ask me to explain how he did it. I don't know, nor do you. But God can manipulate his laws. God can work things out in that regard. And there are multiple examples of that in the Bible. Did you ever stop to think about the fact that when our Lord made the triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem, just a few days before he was crucified, the Bible says he rode on the back of a donkey upon which no man had ever sat? Why don't you try that sometime? <laughs> our Lord had no problem. Because God has control over his creatures. And he can use them, and the Bible is filled with examples of that regard. The Bible also teaches that God providentially uses the nations of the world. Listen to me, brethren. From the beginning of time, God has been working out his plan in this world. I know that from the human vantage point, it must look like to many people that God's plan has not worked very well. That it has not been very effective. But don't you believe it? His purpose will be accomplished. Puny and significant man can never thwart ultimately the work of God. And God has worked among the nations. In Daniel 2.21, God said, I... Remove kings, and I set up kings. In Daniel 4, 17, the prophet Daniel said that God rules in the kingdoms of men and giveth them to whomever he desires to have them, even the lowest of men. Psalm 22, the psalmist affirmed that God is the ruler of the kings of this world. He is in control of the nations. There may be some things that I worry about in life, but I'll tell you one thing I worry not one second about. I don't worry about Russia destroying this country. I don't worry about China destroying this country. No nation will destroy this country until God gets ready for some nation to do it. He may get ready, but I know God is in control of the situation. And he uses the nations of this world to bring about his ultimate purpose. Read the book of Daniel. That's one of the main thrusts of that book. And those empires toppled like dominoes because God had something to do with it. And he told hundreds of years before it came to pass exactly how the situation was going to be. Now let me spend a few moments talking about the providential working of God in our lives. If you don't believe in the providence of God in your life, I genuinely feel sorry for you. Not only because you're missing a great facet of Bible doctrine, but because a real dimension is missing from your life.
The Bible teaches that God operates in a special providential way on behalf of his people. I know that Jesus said in Matthew 5 that God sends his reigns upon the just and the unjust. But I also know that in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19, the Apostle Paul, speaking to Christians, said, And my God shall supply your every need according to his riches. Now let's put a footnote on that. That doesn't mean we can measure the providential working of God in our lives by our financial prosperity. Job knew that the tents of robbers prosper. And David said in Psalm 133, When I beheld the prosperity of the wicked, my feet were well nigh slipped. He almost lost his faith when he observed the prosperity of the wicked. But then he said, God took me into the sanctuary and showed me their latter remains. You see, all accounts are not settled in this life. And so... We need to learn to appreciate the working of God because he says that he works in our lives. Now let me give you just two or three quick examples. In the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 34, verse 23, God promised the Jews that if they would be faithful and keep his laws, and if three times each year when they went up to worship him at Jerusalem in the three annual ceremonies, if they would be faithful to this, while they were gone, all male Jews being involved, none of the nations that lived round about would desire their land. Now all the men were gone, the women and children stayed behind. All the men go to Jerusalem, the women and children stay behind. God said, while you're gone, while you're doing my will, nobody will desire your land. Did you know there is not a single recorded example of where any of Israel's enemies ever attacked them during that time. God gave his promise. In Leviticus chapter 25, God gave the Israelite a command that every seventh year they would let their land lie without cultivating it. And every 50th year they had to do the same thing. Well, how are you going to make a living if you let your land lie without cultivating it? And especially... In the 50th year, you would have the 49th year that it had to lie previous to that. The 50th year following, and then time you sowed, it would be another year before you got a crop. There's three years without any crop. You know what God said? He said, if you'll trust me and do that, I'll give you a three-year crop in one year. But you want me to tell you what? To my knowledge, there is not a single instance in the Old Testament recorded where the Israelites obeyed that command and let their land lie. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, God said that 70 years of Babylonian captivity was on account of the fact that they did not obey that command. They didn't trust God and consequently robbed themselves of a rich blessing. There are other examples to which we could call attention We've mentioned them in the manuscript, in the book. Study that very carefully. Believe in the providence of God. Study this great thing. And recognize the fact, brethren, that God can use you. Just like he used a Joseph, like he used an Esther, like he used an Apostle Paul, he can use people today. But you've got to be willing to let him. You've got to have a sense of destiny. You've got to turn yourself over to him and believe that he can, through you, accomplish great things. We limit ourselves. Let us not do it. Thank you.